Hi, my name is Ashley Champagne. I'm the director for our Center for Digital Scholarship at Brown University Library in Providence, Rhode Island, United States. The talk today is called Planning for Uncertainty, Building Trust in the Midst of Uncertainty in Digital Scholarship Projects. So the reason for this talk is that Centers for Digital Humanities and Digital Scholarship Centers have now widely practiced project management for over a decade, and project management skills have been taught in courses and workshops. Yet communication needs themselves may have shifted, particularly within hybrid and remote contexts. And it's also, I think, a good moment to synthesize what we've learned about project management and how that has changed over the years. So these are just listed a few examples of early project management in DH to show that trajectory. For example, the Princeton Center for Digital Scholarship recently changed their project charter in response to how projects were working in practice. So two projects, including one chartered fully remotely, were key to the center's decision to make these changes in project management. Their work plan became a more abstract roadmap that divided plans into stages rather than a detailed plan because work changes as projects develop. So in other words, their work plan acknowledged inevitable uncertainties and while uncertainty has always been a reality in digital scholarship work because the field rapidly changes, I think remote work also has encouraged a rethinking of how to plan for this uncertainty with more flexible models. And just to emphasize the importance of project planning, if you aren't already convinced, <laughs> this is a data set of digital humanities conferences from 2005 to 2018 visualized in Voyant. And my search term here is project management. And you can see that project management has just increased in popularity within the D Digital Humanities Conference over the years. So why is that? Why, are, why is Digital Humanities so interested in project management? Why is it so needed? Um, and so I think you know, a big reason for this is that Digital Humanities, Digital Scholarship projects require experimentation and planning that requires a different approach than those that are more standardized in, in industry. So as Erin Sheenar notes, the standard approach to project management is derived from a predictable and simple model that doesn't take into account changes or needs in the field. So the project planning required by the U.S. Air Force to integrate engineering and production of missile development programs, for example, requires a different set of considerations than in digital scholarship and other fields. So digital scholarship is boundary pushing, it's widely collaborative, it's fast moving, and it often relies on multiple scholars from different fields and different disciplines. So the traditional model of project management underplays the role of uncertainty, learning, and informal processes that are central to digital humanities work. Digital humanities also is often pushing the field. So we're often planning for what we don't even know yet. Um, and additionally, Many library staff are generalists within centers, and this is for very good reason, because staff have many responsibilities in supporting scholars from disciplines across all levels of the university. They also often manage undergrads who are eager to learn and contribute to the project, so mentorship is a key component. And as these teams work together to experiment with and apply different technologies to produce original research, learning new technologies and theoretical framings and being able to think about accessibility and data ethics along the way is often a significant part of the process. So these centers are also often run as hybrid now. Ours certainly is where staff are in one to two times a week and are remote otherwise. Um, so good communication is really essential. In my paper that just came out under the same title, I share what a variety of other centers are doing in terms of project planning in an attempt to synthesize this in the field. So here I'm showing you Emory, Princeton, Yale, and Brown, and what kinds of documentation they have in their centers for project planning. And this chart is also linked in my slide deck. So almost all of these have project charters, addendums to make changes, additional project planning documents, workout plans and timelines and closeout documents. This is all essential. And the reason I think for this is because we need to have change documents to have flexibility um, because of the field's boundary pushing tenants. We need to acknowledge uncertainty in project development because a lot of our work will require learning along the way. And we also need to have transparent communication. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So I have three questions in this talk that I wanna leave you with. All of them have a bit of tension within them. 
So one is how do you determine the feasibility of taking on a project while also transparently communicating professional development needs? How do you provide professional development opportunities while also putting them into practice right away? How do we invite faculty collaborators to join in the process of planning, which often increases scope, but also keep it to scope? How do you determine the feasibility? I think this goes back to criteria. So each center is gonna have their own criteria. Our particular center at Brown um, basically rides on three questions in order to determine criteria. Does the research question align with our strategic direction? Are staff interested in the project and invested in learning the methodologies required? And are they confident that learning methodologies or tools necessary is, is possible within the window of time needed. And this goes to capacity, right? So if you just don't have the capacity to learn it, even within the time, within the time needed, um, we can't take on the project. But then another part of this question is how do you transparently communicate that feasibility to the stakeholder? Um, and so one is that in project planning, we often um, handle uncertainty by overestimating. Like we think we can get this done in one month, but we'll say we can do it in two months because that will allow us to overperform rather than underperform. But I think that this erodes good trust um, and can. So rather what we try to do in our Center for Digital Scholarship is address uncertainty by speaking and writing honestly about the possibilities, limitations, and uncertainties inherent in working in team and really try to communicate our values of professional development and learning that's inherent in our process. So our second question, how can you provide professional development opportunities while also simultaneously putting those into practice? So here is where I think um, this chart can be helpful. Identifying what skills does your team have and what skills does your team need? Um, so, you know, one way to go about understanding how much flexibility a project needs is to chart out the available staff expertise and compare it to the needs of the project. So this visualization demonstrates this. On the x-axis, there are a variety of skills for which a digital scholarship center might have staff support. And on the y-axis, there are numbers up to five. These are There are also two stacked bars that indicate the technical and theoretical or subject-based skills a team may have. The lines indicate the current skill set of the team, which may or may not equal what the project requires. So you may need a level of Python skill set that's like at a five and you have a two, um, or you may not know anything about the subject matter, like on indigenous enslavement. And so you may need to really spend time learning about that um, within subject matter skill sets. The table two is the profession proficiency levels of staff. So. Um, within one to five, you know, how much experience do they have from no knowledge to multi-year experience, rewriting, expanding, or using the code, um, or to make original contributions to the theoretical impact of the given methodology. Learning is, of course, really helpful in centers, um, and so it's important to take on projects that challenge us. Um, uh, so one of the ways we can take that on is, is by looking at customized projects, which require a little bit more than using off-the-shelf tools like Omeka or Makutu, where we use them regularly in our center and we might be able to map out a pretty accurate timeline. If we go to a customized project, um, we are going to have less certainty about how long things are going to take. So a cur current example of a customized project at our center is Stolen Relations, Recovering Stories of Indigenous Enslavement in the Americas, a community-based project led by Professor Linford Fisher. Stolen Relations is building a database of enslaved Indigenous people throughout time across the Americas in order to promote greater understanding of historical circumstances of Indigenous enslavement and the ongoing trauma of settler colonialism. When we took this project on seven years ago, we didn't have a project planning system in place but if we had, and we had tried to map it out in this way, we would have been able to see quite easily that we needed to spend a lot of time learning in this project plan. Uh, for example, like producing a data model for documents related to indigenous enslavement um, is gonna be a huge learning curve. Um, you know, We didn't know how much troubleshooting, we didn't know if we were gonna use MySQL or a graph database. We didn't know what relevant JavaScript libraries would be needed and things like that. So how do you provide professional development opportunities while also putting these skills into practice? So with the Stolen Relations Project, many of our staff love that project. 
we wanted to work on it. We still want to work on it. We still love that project. Um, and so how we put this into practice is really by building trust with a faculty member. Um, we've communicated very regularly that this is something that we're learning actively and we update our project plans and timelines monthly to be able to communicate what we are, our goal is for that month and then to build on that and what we might achieve in the next month. So then finally, you know, how can you invite faculty collaborators to join you in the project planning effort, but also keep it feasible? And here, I just want to acknowledge some challenges. Yes. So a study from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, found that staff and faculty relationships can be challenging for a number of reasons. Working on project documentation together can help manage those expectations. But the study found there are many misperceptions about roles and responsibilities that can lead to misunderstanding, communication challenges at an interpersonal and university level. And there are skill gaps for faculty and staff in supervisory and managerial roles compounded by the variations of security power and recognition between faculty and staff. And so many centers have responded to this, um, you know, so people have written about a collaborator's bill of rights like Tanya Clement, and we have a collaborator's bill of rights at CDS here. Um, project charters, memorandums of understanding, and there's lots of different templates for digital scholarships. Um, an adjustment that we've made at our Brown CDS is to explain uncertainties we see in the project plan and where the timeline might need adjustments. So we make sure to emphasize um, what we don't know as much as what we know. And finally, I want to leave you with a few recommendations for project planning based on my experience and my role as the director for our Center for Digital Scholarship at Brown. So documentation, of course, is essential, but especially so for what's uncertain in the project. Um, design for flexibility as much as you can. So we have a month by month timeline that we adjust regularly across projects to assess goals and determine where we're at and build the project based on that. And then third, to communicate openly. So build trust with a faculty member by communicating your values um, and what your process is like. Finally, thank you so much. And please reach out. I'd love to hear about your stories about project planning, your challenges, your successes, um, particularly in the schoolable context of digital humanities.